This week is all about the long search for peace and our religious leaders creating an impact in fostering harmony between warring nations in Africa. Plus, why are young Nigerians crying out for help? Who has neglected or forsaken them? And why? All that coming up shortly. Welcome to Wild of Africa with me, Eric Njoka. Now, the motto for the Pope's trip in Africa was all reconciled in Christ, which many understood in the context of the political situation in South Sudan and the Democratic Republic of Congo. The Pope's messages during his visit was expected to change the reality in which local people live. And according to some experts, it did. And just before the pontiff departed for Rome, an unusual development occurred in the Horn of Africa nation of Ethiopia, where the Prime Minister convened a meeting with the Trigrai forces. So, did the Premier take a cue from His Holiness and tried his luck at fostering peace and harmony? Let's find out in this World of Africa report. Just as St. John Paul II became a beacon for freedom from tyranny, Pope Francis has become the pontiff who speaks for the poor and the disenfranchised. This was true in his just concluded Africa tour of the Democratic Republic of Congo and South Sudan. Pope Francis went to Africa as a peacemaker, focusing his energy on trying to bring together Christians and Muslims in the region. This at a time when militant Islamist groups seek to stir divisions between communities. The visit revealed much about this Pope and about the Roman Catholic Church in Africa. The Pope's message was heard loud and clear and embraced by the faithful in the countries he visited and the world. Hands off the Democratic Republic of Congo. Hands off Africa. Stop choking Africa. It is not a mine to be stripped or a terrain to be plundered. May Africa be the protagonist of its own destiny. Everywhere he went in Africa, the Pope made sure that he visited the children of the slums, refugees and the families that are unable to afford a meal. You know, when the time when he passed through, my tears was flowing because seeing a Pope always in a picture, but today seeing him with my own eyes, I was shed down, uh, my tears was flowing. Your Holiness, I can attest, it is the women, the children, the elderly, the people with disabilities who suffer the most. Now being beaten, in this throughout the war front at 2013, 2016, Women have suffered, they are displaced and they are exposed now to, to, to the situation of war where they are raped, where they are beaten, where they become more vulnerable, you know, because they work for the whole family that is displaced because they are not living in their original homes. They are living outside their home and they are missed a lot. May you, Almighty God, bless you, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. The unprecedented message of Pope Francis during his African tour relates to sustainable peace and unity, economic development and citizenry welfare. His messages also touched on social questions, especially how to forge an illuminating future devoid of ethnic rivalries, corruption and distrust that have fueled so many bloody conflicts in Africa. The 86-year-old Pope's message resonated with many Africans, especially the youth, downtrodden and marginalized citizens in the continent. But at the Horn of Africa nation of Ethiopia, the warring sides, the government and Tigray rebel forces seem to be taking a cue from the pontiff, who did not tour the region. Ethiopia's Prime Minister met the leaders of rival Tigray forces for the first time since a devastating two-year conflict ended with a peace deal late last year. State media showed Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed meeting with the Tigray side's lead negotiators and others. It didn't say when the meeting occurred. 
The conflict cut off the Tigray region of more than 5 million people with humanitarian aid often blocked and basic services severed while health workers pleaded for the simplest of medical supplies. Pressure over the fate of civilians helped lead to the peace deal. The conflict is estimated to have killed half a million citizens in Tigray. Others were killed in neighboring Amhara and Afar regions. Bureau report, we on World is One. East African regional leaders have renewed their call for an immediate ceasefire by all sides in the conflict in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo that pits the country's military against a rebel group that the government has accused Rwanda of supporting. The leaders' meeting in Burundi was the latest diplomatic effort to try to end the conflict, which has displaced at least 520,000 people since March last year in North Kivu. Here now is a report from Bujumbura. The leaders arrived in Bujumbura, Burundi, in their numbers. East Africa was teetering towards a war. The heads of state had to do something, and so they convened in the tiny East African nation to see if they would strike a deal. Presidents of the two countries at loggerheads, Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of Congo, were also present at the weekend forum. What is happening in DRC as you know it is genocide, no doubt. It is genocide but which is happening in another country. While other countries are not declaring that, it is genocide that is taking place in DRC. The leaders renewed their call for an immediate ceasefire by all sides in the conflict in eastern DRC that pits the country's military against a rebel group it has accused Rwanda of supporting. The deliberations were so heated that one time the Congolese president Felix Chikedi was seen confronting the commander of the East African Regional Force, who he has been accusing of colluding with the M23 rebels. The meeting was the latest diplomatic effort to try to end the insurgency, which has displaced at least 520,000 people since March 2022 in North Kivu, a territory long plagued by conflict. The head of state directed also as follows. One, there must be immediate ceasefire by all political parties. Two, the withdrawal, including all foreign armed groups and directed the chief of defense forces of all the partner states of the East African community to meet urgently within the next one week and set new timelines for the withdrawal and recommend appropriate deployment matrix in different Parts of Eastern DRC. Heads of state from Rwanda, Congo, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania and Burundi and senior officials from the region demanded the withdrawal of all foreign and armed groups from Congo and asked regional military chiefs to meet within one week and set a time frame for the withdrawal. M23 rebels in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo had in early January promised to retreat from a strategic position even as they conquered territories elsewhere, throwing confusion over the future direction of a year-long conflict. A Tutsi-led group, the M23 conquered swaths of territory in North Kivu province in recent months and advanced towards its capital, Goma. It first leaped to prominence in 2012, when it captured Goma, a city of more than one million people, before being driven out and going to ground the following year. We will always expand our radius of defense. This is how we were forced to take localities, cities, lands. But we don't need to take lands. What to do with them? We always have and always demand that there is a sincere dialogue, a direct dialogue with the government. Nous voulons, nous avons toujours... Despite several deliberations or forums in efforts to foster harmony, 
The conflict has inflamed regional tensions with Congo, accusing neighbor Rwanda of backing and sponsoring the Tutsi-led rebellion. United Nations experts and Western powers have also accused Rwanda of backing the M23. Although Rwanda has denied any involvement, on January 27th, M23 rebels took control of the town of Kitshanga in Masisi territory and control of a new road, further isolating the provincial capital, Goma. Reports suggest that the M23 rebels are advancing further eastward, causing misery, as the conflict is showing no signs of an end anytime soon. Bureau Report, we own World is One. Nigeria is observing Mental Health Week. This year's theme is Let's Connect. Despite close family ties and communal living in Nigeria, mental health awareness is underrated in the country. The emotional care, especially for children and teenagers, is inadequate, leading to a lack of positive thinking among the youth. Here's a report by our correspondent, Louisa Olani. A UNICEF 2021 study reveals that one in six young Nigerians between 15 to 24 often feel depressed. They have very little interest in doing things or are worried, nervous or anxious. Globally, far too many children are burdened under the weight of unaddressed mental health issues. A UNICEF report shows that Nigerian children feel under most pressure to succeed globally. Coupled with the learn to grow up with a thick skin culture, it has contributed to children bottling up challenges, which impacts their mental health negatively. Which the presidents or the government should take care of the children because the way the children, they are the leaders of tomorrow, and if they don't take care of them, there are so many people are dying on the streets, fighting each other, using guns to attack each other. It's because of there is more no welfare taking care of them. I think everybody faces um, such kind of situations because most of the times you are, un you are unable to voice out your own opinions, especially when those around you give little or no consent to how you feel or what you want to express to what you want to express. So then again, most times people tend to bottle those feelings in. Well, I do believe that, yes, it is good to have thick skin, but there's also a difference between right and wrong. It got to a point where um, even just the culture alone, even outside of school, you'd go out to parties with your friends and different things that happen, whether it's harassment, physical or sexual, or maybe people are like, it goes beyond teasing your friends because they're your friends. It's kind of like now you're just bullying them. And it's like it's become a culture where it's now you, they want you to accept it. And when you get upset, they look at it as why are you being upset? Like we all went through it. But just because we all went through it doesn't mean that it is right. And things need to be done and people need to speak up. According to latest estimates by UNICEF, over one in seven between the age 10 to 19 are diagnosed with mental health problem globally. Almost 46,000 adolescents die by suicide each year, which is among the top five causes of death for the age group. And this is also according to UNICEF. Wide gaps persist between mental health needs and mental health funding as experts decry shortage of trained mental health practitioners. We don't have enough. There are many times when we're looking for mental health professionals and you find them in pockets. You find them in pockets. There should be a line where, you know, a child is going through something, especially the teenagers and preteens, especially preteens, especially teenagers. There should be a line where they can call or someone they can go to that is safe and trusted and won't abuse them because abuse is another issue that we have to deal with. That won't abuse them and they can talk to in confidence and they know that their secret is safe with that person because a lot of people run their, their mouths so that's another thing with people that have mental health challenges they don't have someone they can trust or they don't feel they have someone they can trust so they bottle it up all in until it gets out of hand theme for this year's um, children's mental health week is let's connect and this again is talking about how social interactions positive social interactions with friends families plays a good impact in helping with um, emotional and mental well-being. 
So we are now what we are seeing in practice now is the aftermath and consequences of the prolonged period of lockdown where people are isolated. And we now see children developing anxiety and various forms of phobia and not being able to, to cope with pressures of day-to-day -day life. So the theme of this year specifically is, is, is reminding us about the importance of connecting with our loved ones, family, friends and faiths. According to a January 2022 WHO report, over 20 million Nigerians are currently suffering from various degrees of mental illness or disorder without psychiatric health care. A lot of youth don't even talk about mental health issues due to their fear of stigmatization. Raising a child can be challenging, even under the best circumstances. And observing changes in children about more serious health issues in the future. Many adults who seek mental health treatment reflect on the impact of mental disorders and societal pressure on their childhood and wish they had received help sooner in the past, as experts have called for vigilance amongst children and teenagers in their formative years. From Lagos, Nigeria, Louisa Olani, we on World is One. In South Africa, ransom kidnappings are on the rise. An Ethiopian community in particular feels that Ethiopian businessmen are being specifically targeted. The community has been staging several demonstrations all across the country. Our correspondent Calden Ongmu filed this report. These are Ethiopian community members in South Africa. They are outside Johannesburg Magistrates Court making their voices heard. The members are objecting bail of an alleged mastermind of kidnappings. They feel terrorized and do not want to live like this. This business, Ethiopian businessmen are targeted by kidnappers. This is very lucrative business to get easy money. They kidnap for a big amount of ransom. We are getting report. Recently we got this in recent months in all over South Africa, we get more than 10 business people are kidnapped. This 42-year-old Ethiopian runs a clothing business in Johannesburg with his family. Not very long ago, his wife was kidnapped for ransom. They was kidnapped my wife and they asked me some ransom. Otherwise, they, she's going to be get killed if I don't pay them the money. Even my community, the business community, been in fear. The whole in town is terrorized. They get a call. Some guys, they come, they call. And it, it would be strange to go to our workplace. Usually, we do a business in town. So uh, we don't go there now. In 2022, the crime stats revealed a massive spike in the number of kidnappings in South Africa. There were over 4,000 kidnappings recorded between July and September of 2022, an increase of over 100% compared to the previous quarter. Experts are of the view that ransom kidnappings are definitely on the rise. Since 2016, we have seen a significant and gradual increase in the number of kidnappings for ransom taking place in the country. Some of those kidnapping for ransom are carried out by highly organized transnational um, syndicates where they are targeting um, business people with significant or their family members who have significant amounts of money and where significant ransoms are demand. South Africa is fast becoming a hub for kidnapping. Police say they are doing all in their power to nab the kingpins, but this can only be done if communities unite and come together to fight this scourge. This is Galden Olmo from Johannesburg, South Africa. For We On, World is One. Let me start by asking you a question. How many children is enough? Well, that's not a question we want to ask the man we will feature in this next report. This man right here. His name is Musa Kasera. And he has so many children, he cannot remember most of their names. The Ugandan villager is struggling to provide for his vast family that he says includes 12 wives, 102 children, and an incredible 578 grandchildren. And now he feels enough is enough. Here's a report. 
This is Bugisa in Uganda. Musa Hassan literally has whole village as a family. Now feels enough is enough. The Ugandanese struggling to provide for his vast family that he says includes 12 wives, 102 children and 578 grandchildren and there is something else bothering him too. Are you aware, my fellow parents, that the problem I have with these 102 kids, I can only remember the first child and the last one, but some other children in the middle, I cannot remember all the names. Currently unemployed, Hasaya has become a tourist attraction in his village. He says his wives now take birth control to stop the family from expanding further. He married his first wife in 1972 at a traditional ceremony when they were both about 17 and his first child Sandra Nabwere was born a year later. Attracted by his then status as a cattle trader and butcher, Hasaya said villagers would offer their daughters hand in marriage, even some below the age of 18. <laughs> I did not know that her husband would continue bringing other wives to us. When he brought another one, I remember I felt so bad and angry. But with time, I got used to it all. Hasaya can't even recall the names of some of his wives. He has to consult one of his sons, Shaban Magino, for that. 30-year-old Magino is a primary school teacher and helps run the family's affairs. He is one of the few to have received an education to resolve disputes in such a huge setup, Hasaya says they have monthly family meetings. Uh, you know, in terms of uh, educating the kids, you know, is my dad here failed to educate all of us. Mm -hmm. So when I get that, I also come to attention that no, I should not have a family like this one. I have only two hectares that my father left me, and in these two hectares. This is where we have all these children, and it has been a very big problem. I have had many problems, finding school fee money, providing food for everyone, finding clothes and money to help in case someone is sick. Most of the residents are peasants. They do small-scale farming of crops such as rice, cassava, coffee or raised cattle. Many members of the family try to earn money or food by doing chores for their neighbours or spend their days fetching firewood and water, often travelling long distance on foot. <laughs> Those at home sit around the grounds, some women weaving mats or plaiting hair, while men play cards under the shelter of a tree. Bureau Report We On, World Is One. And it's a wrap on this episode of Wild of Africa. Thank you very much for your time and for watching. Find us on all our social media platforms and talk to us there. We always appreciate feedback. I'm Eric Njoka. I will see you on the next show.